friends. Uh, it is a great honor for myself to stand this day to introduce a, our speaker this evening, Dr. Skousen. He was the man that really inspired me to study the life of J. Reuben Clark. He often quotes him in his talks, and it's been quite a quite a great journey for me to learn of this man because I was seven years old when J. Reuben Clark died, and I really didn't know him personally, but I've come to really appreciate J. Reuben Clark, Jr., and I know after you hear Dr. Skousen speak of this great man today, you'll great, you will appreciate J. Reuben Clark, Jr. for his accomplishments. Our speaker, he served 16 years with the FBI, a professor at BYU for more than 10 years, author of more than 30 books. He has given lectures in 44 foreign countries and all 50 states. He has gained an international reputation as an authority on governmental philosophy. He is the founder of the National Center for Constitutional Studies, which was established to help restore constitutional principles in the tradition of America's founding fathers. And I know that he's also a great admirer of J. Reuben Clark, Jr. And I give you Dr. W. Cleon Skousen. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Bill, and uh, Mayor Murray, and Senator Mantes, and Representative Nelson, and all you wonderful, distinguished people. I feel honored tonight to be here on this historic occasion when we are initiating a, a whole new series of programs honoring this great friend and native of this community, J. Reuben Clark. I'd like to say right here at the beginning, wish I had Ron's voice. <clears throat> My, that was beautiful. And uh, I had a voice not like that one because mine was tenor. 30 years ago though, I could really uh, boot it out pretty good. <clears throat> but time has taken its toll and after an average of about 350 speeches per year <laughs> for, yay, these many years, <clears throat> it's a little bit on the rusty side. But uh, I appreciate a good voice when I hear one, and that was great tonight. I, I just want you to know what it did to me rolling across this highway coming in here tonight been a few years since I've been here, but I visualize the time when this valley will be filled, and Grantsville will have its, its own place as a center of a lot of very grateful people that you have preserved the inheritance of this environment that's here. It won't be long before Utah is filled. As I move across the country, both east and west, I feel the restlessness. I feel the anxieties. I feel the insecurity of people for their children, for themselves, for their, for their safety. They know something is very seriously threatening on the horizon of the future. And they instinctively sense that in these cloistered valleys of these mountains, there is a spirit of protection and security, which if we live worthy of it, will one, be, one day be the salvation of many millions of people who will look to these mountains for safety and protection. We wish sometimes that we could control events but as we read the writings of the great persons that God raised up and allowed to see the future, we know that uh, there, would be come, there would come a time when there would be a generation that would really feel the, um, uh, 
well, they would see the fulfillment of what these prophets saw. And it would be very challenging. And it would take uh, people with great integrity and, and capacity for endurance to stand steady and know that God is in his heavens, that his purposes will be fulfilled, and that the blessings we have just living here are beyond measure, beyond measure. J. Reuben Clark knew that. This is sacred ground to him. You know, he used to come out here to recharge his spiritual battery. Isn't that something? Come out here and ride those beautiful horses of which he was so proud that I understand what's well, about two, two or three miles from, from here. I've seen pictures of it, even though I've never visited it. But I feel very happy to be in the home territory of J. Reuben Clark. In a sense, I sort of followed in some of his footsteps back to Washington and so forth, and I watched uh, the, the great uh, impact that he had made wherever he went. When I was interviewed for the bar, passing of the bar in Washington, D.C., a man who was interviewing me um, and said, did you know J. Reuben Clark? And I said, yes, I do know him. Well, he said, I, I sat next to him. My desk was next to him for four or five years in the State Department. I never knew a more righteous Christian gentleman than J. Reuben Clark. And then when I told this to President Clark <clears throat> on one occasion, and he embarrassed me by asking me the man's name. <laughs> And uh, I think I've identified him as I've gone through the biographies and everything, but he certainly admired J. Reuben Clark. He loved him as a fellow Christian. And J. Reuben Clark, during nearly all of his life, pioneered in the sense that he carried the message, uh, the charter, and the banner of the restored gospel wherever he went, to law school, into the State Department, into the highest circles of um, post-war arbitration um, meetings, etc. He was well known for what he was. He didn't push it on people, but the word would pass. He's a Mormon. <laughs> There'd be, you know, people suck in their breath <laughs> oh, is that right? You know, you can just hear it. <clears throat> In any event, because they have so many um, preconceived ideas, inaccurate as they are, but uh, in any event, it makes a person stand out and, and make inquiry so that they eventually know them better. And everywhere that J. Reuben Clark went, he aroused admiration except for a period of his life that I will tell you about tonight. Now, everything I'm going to tell you is out of three books. This is J. Reuben Clark, The Public Years, by Frank Fox. This is J. Reuben Clark, The Church Years, by Michael Quinn. This book is called Tragedy and Hope. This is written by Carol Quigley of Georgetown University. It's one of the more prominent histories of the world in our time. Big 1,300 pages. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> Bill Clinton praised Carol Quigley the other night in his acceptance speech and said this man, when Clinton attended Georgetown, inspired him and, and gave him great visions of the future, and he therefore became a Rhodes Scholar and and became part of a team that I'm going to tell you about tonight that have great ambitions to change our society and change the Constitution. And he's not alone because President Bush had the same training. Kind of interesting because they have gobbled up most of those who exhibited leadership qualities and abilities and tried to get them to join a movement to accomplish 
a, a new world order. They're now coming out and calling it the new world order. And when you sit down and talk with them, you say, my, that, that sounds like that would be great. But J. Reuben Clark knew exactly what it would produce. And last night in the newspaper, I saw a full page ad by just an ordinary citizen down in, in Florida. And he said, I've had it. I've had it, and I'll tell you why. And he just went ahead and itemized all the 66% of our income taxes going to pay interest on a, an accumulated debt. And that interest, of course, is being paid to a number of major banking houses that bought up <coughs> the, um, the government IOUs that have been issued over the years by the tens of thousands, even the millions, and they've got them, and we're paying them. And J. Reuben Clark saw that all coming. It came after his day, mostly, but he ran into it head on when he was just a young uh, law student, not law student, but uh, practicing law. And so that's the little story that I want to tell you briefly about tonight. My problem is I only know uh, a pittance of the real J. Reuben Clark, but it's a lot more than I could tell in the, in the time that would be available tonight. And every year when you meet, you might even take a theme out of his writings. Any one of, of, oh, I can think of 20 or 30 themes you could take out of his writings would fill a whole evening just learning to appreciate the mind and the leadership of this man. Now I want to just read a page or so of biographical notes here at the beginning so <clears throat> I don't miss any details. Tonight we are celebrating the 121st birthday of J. Reuben Clark, Jr., he was the first of 10 children. When he was born in Grantsville, the population was 1,240 people. But when he had died in 1961, it had grown to 2,100 people. <laughs> How are we doing now, Mayor? Are we, <laughs> are we holding it? Yeah, we gotta hold it. Because uh, you're pivotal to a great growth of the future. Um, Actually, he liked the fact that Grantsville was a small town. He called it his spiritual retreat. Now, his mother was Mary Woolley, daughter of Edwin D. Woolley, a former Quaker who joined the church and became a close friend of Joseph Smith. And after the move to Utah, he became a business associate of Brigham Young, and I think he was a bishop of one of the wards in Salt Lake City for a couple of decades. His father, um, J. Reuben's father, was Joshua Clark. Now, he never was christened Joshua Reuben Clark. He, he found that when the mail came through while he was fighting in the Civil War, there were too many J. Clarks. So he just stuck in Reuben <laughs> to give it a little character and dignity. And of course, then that became a family name. His father was Joshua Clark, uh, son of a German, uh, that is, J. Reuben's father, as I've mentioned, was Joshua Clark, son of a German Baptist who belonged to the Brotherhood called the Dunkards. He served in the Union Army, that is, Joshua did, served in the Uni Union Army during the Civil War, and then went west to haul freight. And while going through Farmington on a Sunday and being a good Baptist, he stopped off and went to church. Different than any church he was ever in before, but they were all baptized. That made it pretty good for a Baptist. And so uh, he stayed over. He kind of liked the people. It wasn't very long before he was baptized and became a member. Now, he asked if there was any place where he might get a job because he was a teacher. And they said, well, they have a ward school out in Grantsville that they're looking for a teacher. So he came out here and he got the job. Joshua met Mary Woolley at a Christmas party in Salt Lake. And they were married in the Salt Lake Temple in 1870. And J. Reuben was born the following year, 1871, first of 10 children. His mother began his homeschooling early. 
you homeschoolers, you see, it's, it goes with Grantsville. And then he attended his father's ward school in town for one year. And uh, then the, the father began to realize his education was more limited than he had thought. This son of his asked more questions. <laughs> and so he had his son go, go ahead to the regular school beginning at the age of 10. And by this time, he was an important asset to the family farm. At age nine, he was milking two cows, taking care of the irrigation turns. And by the time he was 11, he was hauling rocks for their new stone house that his father built. And he was uh, able to brand calves and round up cattle on his cow pony. By mid-teens, he could use hand shears to shear 11 sheep a day. And I don't know whether ever you've tried to wrestle a sheep and get that wool off his back, but that's, uh, that's an assignment, even for a teenage boy. Now, on September the 2nd, 1879, he was baptized by his father and confirmed by the stake president. Stake president was Francis M. Lyman. Brother Lyman had been sent to preside over the Tooele stake by Brigham Young. He didn't particularly want to come. He had a nice place in Salt Lake, but uh, that's the way Brigham Young did it. He would just uh, simply say, Brother Lyman, they need a stake president out in Tooele, which was then, the, and that stake was the whole county. So you just go out there, will you, and we'll ordain you to be their stake president. <laughs> so he came out, but he was released uh, about a year later in 1880 to become apostle. And they sent out a young 23-year-old boy <laughs> to be their new stake president. Well, the folks out here were tough pioneer stock. And this young whippersnapper from Salt Lake City, age 23, he wasn't very well received. And Brother Woolley came out and assured the people, he's a fine young man, has great promise. His name was Heber J. Grant. Now, little did the nine-year-old J. Reuben Clark know how important this young stake president was going to be in his life. About a year later, they asked Heber J. Grant if he would have his picture taken. So he went in and had it taken by Charles Savage, who became probably the most famous photographer in Utah, over oh, indebted to him for a lot of these pictures of our wonderful antecedents who settled these valleys. And uh, while Charles Savage was preparing to take the photograph of uh, Heber J. Grant, he suddenly stopped. He said, young man, Within a year, you will be named and ordained an apostle in the Quorum of the Twelve. And of course, the shock, Brother Heber J., <laughs> bad enough to be a stake president, <laughs> and to tell him he's going to be an apostle. But one year and four days later, it was suddenly announced that the vacancy in the Quorum of the Twelve would be filled by this young man, only 26 years of age, named Heber J. Grant. Big, tall, sturdy boy. Uh, I mean, this, this wasn't exactly what he would have chosen for a career. Uh, he wanted to be a baseball player. You remember that story? We couldn't pitch worth a darn but he learned to be a great pitcher just by doing it over and over again. And he had a terrible scribbling hand. You thought he was a doctor or something. And uh, so he just took lessons and he became one of the most beautiful penmen in Utah. And I'm sure some of you have books in which he has inscribed his name because at Christmas time he used to send out a a nice little book or memento of some kind with that beautiful signature in it. Now I want to say another word about Heber J. Grant because he figured so closely in the life of J. Reuben Clark. He um, felt very uncomfortable in his calling. He didn't speak very well and, um, and he didn't even sing that well. 
And my um, grandmother, who was his cousin, sat at the piano by the hour, saying, now, Heber, it's up a little. Listen carefully, it's up a little. And he'd go up a little. And then she'd hit another note, no, it's down a little. And then up a little, up a little more. And he would go over that until my grandma, uh, who was an Ivan's, almost went crazy, but he learned to sing. And at conferences, he'd insist on doing it. I don't know whether you were ever at a state conference where Heber J. Grant sang, but <clears throat> sometimes uh, he'd announce a song he was going to sing, uh, and the pianist would start singing, uh, playing, getting the, uh, the background for the song he was going to sing, and he'd sing a different song. <laughs> he'd have to change fast and try to get it in the key. Oh, what a great man. He was another great, great, great human being, prepared in time to be a prop to the Lord. Well, in the beginning, he was very uncomfortable. And as he was going horseback riding down to a conference and coming back, he'd given a pretty poor speech. And uh, he said, I don't have the spirit with me yet. Something's wrong. I just don't feel that I, the spirit of my calling isn't with me yet. And so as they stopped or crossed the little brook, he stopped to give his horse a drink, let the brethren all go by and knelt down beside that horse and said, Heavenly Father, am I really where I'm supposed to be? All of a sudden the veil parted he saw a group of men seated around a table. He recognized some of them. It was quite a large group. Looked like a quorum of 12 apostles or something. But there was Brigham Young, who had been dead for a number of years. And there was Joseph Smith. And there was his father who had died a number of years before. And they were talking about selecting a, an apostle. And someone said, Joseph, we don't have any of your descendants in the church. But Rachel was sealed to you, and she now has a son, Heber. Why don't we have him made the new apostle so at least you be represented by him? And they all agreed, and the veil closed, the vision disappeared, and Heber J. Grant knelt there crying. He didn't get the honor of being an apostle because of himself. He was there to honor someone else. And he set his face like flint, as Isaiah says you have to do sometimes, to try and represent the first prophet of the restored church the best he could. I'm sure all of you have heard that account before. It's been published a number of times in the ear and elsewhere, but to me, it's a very precious story. We don't know very often why we find ourselves in, in special places or with special callings. The main thing is to perform it well and honorably. Now, J. Reuben Clark finished the eighth grade uh, here in Grantsville, <clears throat> but there was no high school. So he took the eighth grade again. And he didn't want to miss going to school. He just loved to go to school. So he graduated from the eighth grade three times in Grantsville. And uh, then um, he was ordained a priest at 17. His father ordained him an elder at 18 and ordained him at 70 at 19. And finally in 1890, his father enrolled him in the LDS College in Salt Lake City which had a new young principal named James E. Talmadge. James E. Talmadge is another one of our favorite people. He was born in Britain, came west, went to college at the Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, then went to Johns Hopkins. And what an individual. I mean, he, he uh, became an expert in... Uh, um, a whole series of things. He started out in geology, and then he advanced over to chemistry, then he went into medicine, and finally he became, he received an honorary degree from one of the Protestant universities back east for his Bible scholarship. 
that something? James E. Talmadge. Now, you see, he himself wasn't much older than J. Reuben Clark, but he had this position over the school in Salt Lake City, and he watched this young fellow. He comes in there with no high school education, and he comes into the LDS College, and lo and behold, the very first year, he's the only one of 75 students to get any hundreds on his tests. And he had a number of 90s and a number of 80s, nothing below 80s, except in one field, penmanship. <laughs> He flunked it, and he hadn't learned how quite to write with a scroll, etc. Um, he gave up on penmanship and took shorthand and became an expert in shorthand. Isn't that interesting? And so uh, Dr. Talmadge hired him as his secretary and uh, had him earn $50 a month as his assistant and the curator of the new Deseret uh, Museum they were setting up, and Dr. Talmadge was in charge of that along with the school, etc. And then his father was called on a mission. You know, it just amazes me when I think of this man now with a whole brood of children, and his oldest son is over in Salt Lake City, and he's got to turn that farm over to his wife and all these young children while well, he fulfills a mission, and he did it. And out of that $50, J. Reuben Clark supported his father for two years, that $50 a month. Of course, we know that $50 bought a lot more in those days, <laughs> but that, that just uh, amazes me. And that just shows you the spirit of that family and the spirit of Joshua Clark this uh, former German Baptist headed up that marvelous family. Now, in 1898, A. Reuben Clark had gone to four years of college at what turned out to be the University of Utah. Graduated uh, first in his class. He was student body president and he was the, um, uh, the speaker for his class. He had also been the editor of the Chronicle. I mean, <laughs> there were great qualities of leadership and an intensity of purpose in this J. Reuben Clark from Grantsville. Now, he barely got out of college and <clears throat> there was a sweet girl and they spell her name L-U-A-C-I-N-E, and I've always assumed that it was pronounced Lucine, or Lute as he called her for just short. And if I'm wrong on that, I hope some of you will correct me. But anyway, he married the daughter of, um, of our famous Charles Savage photographer. And uh, they began their married life. Well, he got a job up at Heber, $85 a month. Oh, that was luxurious. That was pretty good wage. And he remained there one year when they asked him to go down and preside over the branch of the University of Utah at Cedar City. And he loved it down there, but at the end of the year, he proposed a budget to make this little school in Cedar City a great school, and he quadrupled the budget petition and got fired. So he came back to Salt Lake City, and he uh, began studying business law and shorthand and uh, sharpening up on his shorthand um, under the guidance of Joseph Nelson, who owned and ran the Salt Lake Business College. And it was very apparent to Joseph Nelson that uh, if J. Reuben Clark wasn't a genius, he made up for whatever he might have lacked with hard work. He had already gotten into his 14-hour-a-day routine. You know, sometimes we say, we don't have time. He took the time. And it, it made a great scholar out of him. So, 
At age 32 in the year 1903, he was offered an advance by Joseph Nelson. He said, I'm going to pay for you to go to law school. Oh, J. Rubin was so anxious to go to law school. So he'd written to Yale and he'd written to Harvard. Oh, the, the, the cost of going to those two schools was and still is outrageous. And he didn't like the spirit of the Harvard dean who wrote him back. He was very highfalutin and snobbish. And so he said, I, I wouldn't go to that school. <laughs> so he decided he wanted to go to Columbia. Now, all of these schools were originally started by various religious organizations. Columbia was started by the Episcopal Church. But he's going to the law school at Columbia, so he had two little daughters by now, and he packed up and went to New York on money loaned to him from Brother Nelson. Uh, right from the beginning, he began those 14, or he continued those 14 hours of study, and everyone was amazed. He, the only Mormon any of them had ever met, but what a worker. And the next thing you know, he's on the Columbia Law Review panel which was a very rare special opportunity. And a little later on, they let him have the recent cases analysis, where they take all the latest cases from the appellate courts, analyze them, to decide whether or not the courts had made a correct decision, etc. And one of his favorite professors um, was um, James Scott, Dr. James Scott. And um, it was just within a year uh, James Scott had um, an assignment to write a couple of texts, and they were mostly written by J. Reuben Clark. And uh, Scott took the full credit for it, didn't say anything in the preface about who'd done all the work and hunted up all the cases, etc. J. Reuben Clark had written two texts in the name of Joseph Scott, or James Scott. But Scott was then invited to become the solicitor of the United States State Department, and he immediately hired J. Reuben Clark as his assistant. This was the beginning of six years in the State Department in the solicitor's office. And when I was being interviewed to pass the bar in Washington, one of those companions that admired J. Reuben Clark as a great Christian gentleman worked with him during that period. Well, it wasn't very long before J. Reuben Clark had written some of the most notable uh, synopses of, um, or background, or briefs on various problems that came up. Uh, uh, that was a period, you know, when we had the revolution in Mexico, we got American citizens down there. Do we have a right to invade that country to protect the uh, the rights of our citizens, and he wrote the brief that justified it. So in the State Department, he was becoming a, a very strong voice for principles, and he always justified it with good research, etc. Now, he got behind two or three policies that he later repented of. <laughs> Dollar diplomacy was one of them. Interventionism turned out to be another. He eventually took the position that while we are entitled to go and protect our citizens. We have no business doing what we did in Mexico. We didn't like the president. So we manipulated and maneuvered diplomatically and otherwise and got him kicked out and put our man in, and he was 10 times worse. And so J. Reuben Clark used to say, don't try to go in and solve the problems of other countries. You don't have the right and you won't do it as well as they do. Most of the time, you'll make a mess of it. And we did in Mexico. And I was responsible for it. <laughs> that is, he, he thought, you know, we gotta straighten the Mexicans out. We gotta give them a good president. And, and the one they chose, it's kinda like Saul. Uh, you'll remember that Saul went in there and. Samuel was brokenhearted because he'd been rejected as the priesthood leader. He'd won battles against the Philistines and everything else. And the people said, but your two sons are very wicked. And when you die, they'll come in and 
We want a king like all the rest of the people. He went to the Lord, and the Lord says, they're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. But I'll give him a king, and, and he'll be the best that's available. Great, big, tall fellow from the tribe of Benjamin, head and shoulders above his fellows. Put him in there, and he was great. He was a great warrior. He won battles. But one time when Samuel wasn't there to start a battle out with a blessing and a sacrifice, Saul put on the priestly robes and uh, decided on off a sacrifice in place of Samuel. And when Samuel arrived, he said, I wish you hadn't done that. I was going to be able to promise you victory now. You will not only be defeated, but you're rejected by God as the king of these people and a neighbor of yours will rule in your stead. Oh, no, Saul said, no, no, whatever you say, no. Samuel said, it's too late. A little later on, Samuel was moping because we'd lost this great king. He was so good looking. I mean, he was so kingly. And the Lord said, what are you moping around about Saul for? I have someone else to choose. Now you go down into Bethlehem where Jesse lives and I'll show you who the new king should be. So he went down there and he said to Jesse, bring in your sons, I want to see them. In come a son, oh, he was as handsome as Saul. And Samuel said, boy, the Lord picks him. But the, whisper said, the spirit whispered and said, no, that's not the man. He said, well, bring in your next son. And he was good looking too. The spirit said, no, that's not the man. Went through six sons. And the spirit wouldn't accept any of them. So you remember then, he said to Jesse, don't you have any more sons? Well, not really. I've just got a little boy. He's out, shepherd boy. Well, Samuel said, bring him in. So as he came through the door, he's a rusty, rugged little fellow, you know. And the uh, uh, spirit says, that's him. Boy, Samuel says, that's, this is dangerous. But he uncorked the bottle, anointed him king. <laughs> Corked it up and went home. The Lord wants him to be king. He can put him on the throne. <laughs> Samuel's not going to take the responsibility for it. And all of you know the circumstances that finally led up to it. Saul called David uh, in to, because he could play the harp and cheer him up. The next thing you know, he had killed Goliath. And it uh, wasn't long after that he became the king. Great stories how the Lord picks people, puts them in the right place, and gives them the circumstances necessary for them to serve. We have this in the life of J. Reuben Clark. Now, as he got to be practically uh, the Secretary of State, it was amazing how all the solicitors, who are the lawyers for the State Department, kept going away or being gone. And this J. Reuben Clark find himself counseling with the President as though he were Secretary of State. And at the end of six years, there was a change in politics. Um, President Wilson was elected. The Republicans went out, and J. Reuben Clark went out with them. Now, he then went into private practice. He was very, very successful. He had a great reputation by now. But he didn't know that he was just about to run head on into one of the most monstrous forces of evil that was being gestated or generated in the United States at that time. Now, in order to tell you that story, which is out of this other book, The History of the World in Our Time, I just have to quote a couple of things. In what we call a people's republic, uh, you do not find tranquility. Everybody has his rights. Everybody is free to speak his opinion, and they all do. And you just have a turmoil of constant bubbling and burbling, and everybody's got their ideas solving problems. It isn't an atmosphere of tranquility. It, it isn't Shangri-La. But when you've educated people, as they did in the early hit part of the history of this country, they loved it that way. They came out of Europe where they were under somebody's thumb and heel all the time, and they loved it here where they could speak their opinions and then vote the way they wanted to, etc. There was one group of people that never liked it. They didn't like the Constitution. They didn't like the turmoil. They didn't like 
this kind of a, of a republic. You see this bubbling and burbling and so forth and everybody putting in their two bits worth, etc. That produced Washington's. That produced uh, Jefferson's, John Adams's. I mean, if you'd been at the Constitutional Convention, uh, it wasn't a nice, sweet, peaceful uh, convention. Those great men with strong opinions hammered and hammered, but when they got through, God says, I established this Constitution by the hands of wise men that I raised up for this very purpose. And anything that's more or less than this is evil. Section 98 and Section 101. And it all came out of this burbling and gurgling. You gotta be, you gotta have fun with it. You gotta get used to it. But these people who are very rich and very powerful have always hated it. The reason they hate it is because they, they operate big industries where they speak and things happen. Where there's a certain amount of order. If there isn't, they can change it. It's like that. And they said, no, that's the way our society should be. That's the way government should be. We've got to change this thing so we've got the smartest people in charge and, and, and compel these stupid masses to do what's good for them. In 1908, there was a congregation of these very wealthy people. They represented the greatest powers in the railroad, in the oil industry, the banking industry, the commercial industry, and they were congregated together in the Carnegie Foundation for International Peace. And they tried to decide how you could change the whole American system, peacefully if possible, but if necessary, do it with war. Now, they worked on that for a year. In time of war, the people will tolerate a collectivization of control and a mandate and people do what they're told to do. They said, now that should be set up so that it's the permanent uh, pattern of our society. And they decided that it, they'd have to do it through war. You've got to get a war, get them in that mood where they will tolerate the the centralized dictatorial mandate and authority, and then have another war if necessary until it becomes a pattern. That's what those men decided to do. The next question was, how would we get control of the government under those circumstances and then maintain it? And the answer was, you've got to control the State Department and the presidency. That's what they agreed upon. We have the minutes of those meetings. And the man who, who secured them almost accidentally, a good friend of mine, working for one of the congressional committees, they got the minutes of 1908 when it was resolved that we're going to use war from now on until we get this nation under control. So they've got to get their own man for president. Then they've got to have him appoint a secretary of state that's of their vintage or mentality. Remember, this is the Carnegie Foundation for International Peace plotting war. Any of you heard of this before? Yeah, some of you have. I didn't get it in school. I had to dig it out years later when, when I found out what was, <laughs> that something was, had gone wrong. Now, the man they picked out to be their president to run in the other party, the Republicans were in power, was a, a man by the name of Woodrow Wilson. He was the head of the Department of Political Science at Princeton. And he'd been very critical of the Constitution for a variety of reasons. He liked the British system better. So they thought that there's somebody we, we could probably mold and, and uh, weave into what we need. And so they started working on him. And um, they got him to be governor of New Jersey, and they elected him. And this is the book that tells how they did it, how they put the money in, and they used money to manipulate and massage the people of New Jersey until they made this professor the governor of New Jersey. And then they're manipulating Woodrow Wilson to agree to this different approach. Uh, maybe we can get back closer to the British system, but certainly we'll change the Constitution. And right in the middle of that, listen to what Woodrow Wilson says. 
Since I entered politics, I have chiefly had men's views confided to me privately. Some of the biggest men in the United States in the field of commerce and manufacture are afraid of somebody. They're afraid of something. They know that there is a power somewhere so organized, so subtle, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive, that they'd better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. That's Woodrow Wilson. He doesn't know it, but they're the people that have now taken him, him in tow. And J.P. Morgan and the Rockefellers and the Carnegie money is going in behind him and getting him set to be president on condition that he will go for a Federal Reserve system that will eventually get rid of gold and silver as a money system, will establish a credit, an, uh, just a, a credit system with no bottom to it. Just use the taxing power of the people as the basis for money in the future. And it's necessary that we do get ourselves involved in the affairs of the world so we can guide the world toward a better structure and, and it will probably have to be through war. Now that's an interesting phenomenon that this book tells all about. Tragedy and hope. Now this man believed in this group. He apologizes for them over and over again. He said that maybe they were a little clumsy but their ultimate goal was a good one. Can't believe it. Then he documents all of the things that I later put in a book called The Naked Capitalist that went to a million copies based on his book, telling people what's really been going on. And for a while it was widely read, but not so much anymore, and people have kind of lost touch with who's running things, the same people. So we got ourselves a new president. Then we got the Federal Reserve. It wasn't very long before as you know, we got rid of gold. Everybody had to turn it in. All the gold clauses in contracts were wiped out by the Supreme Court. J. Reuben Clark knew all this was unconstitutional. The whole fabric was unconstitutional. But meanwhile, he had been trapped just like Woodrow Wilson had. And it all came about in 1916, when a man who was one of the wealthiest men, uh, one of the top men in the country, uh, whose name was Leonard Strait, he was part of the J.P. Morgan people, came to him and asked if he wouldn't like to um, um, have a junior partner. And to have Mr. Strait, you know, as your partner, that is it's Willard Strait, not Leonard. Willard Strait. Oh, this was, you know, for, for a boy out in Grantsville, you know, way out in Utah, I mean, he's gone clear up on the top level. Uh, well, he said, uh, uh, where would we have our office? Oh, in New York. Uh, where in New York? Well, we have a skyscraper there, and we'll be on the lower floor, and you, everything above you will be our client. Just one client? Yeah, just one client. Well, what's it called? The Mer American International Corporation. The first international conglomerate of industrial power that was ever organized in the United States. Well, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to use our money that all our people have, and we're going to start buying up the industries and get things kind of organized together. What J. Reuben Clark didn't know, that they were going to have a war within about 18 months, and they wanted to have all of the the copper and the steel and the boats and the railroads and everything to make the money from it. Clever. American International Corporation. And guess who is its, its attorney? <laughs> J. Reuben Clark. So at first it seemed great because they were buying up these great industries in Central America, the big fruit companies, all of the boats they get their hands on, the wharfs. Steel, copper, I have them all listed here. And the, the head of this international association, listen to who was on their board. Um, Stone of the Webster Engineering Company, Percy Rockefeller of Standard Oil, uh, J. Ogden of the Armor Company, uh, Charles Coffin of General Electric, James Hill of the Great Northern Railway, Otto Kahn of Kuhn Loeb and Company, Robert Lovell of the Union Pacific, and so it goes on. 
I mean, you're talking with the richest, the most powerful, and the strongest. And he's buying up millions and millions of dollars worth of stock in all these companies. And so in 1916, Woodrow Wilson was elected on the basis that he had kept us out of the war. When he was inaugurated, after he was inaugurated, we were in the war within six weeks. It's all in this book. Oh, at that time, I was uh, five, five years old. <laughs> I was getting on the scene now, gradually, here, so I could watch what J. Rubin was doing. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> J. Rubin Clark uh, didn't awaken to what was happening until about 1923. And he began to fuss at them and make their lives so miserable as he saw what they were doing and many times he, he considered dishonestly they fired him 1923 guess what he did he came back on constitution day and spoke in the tabernacle about the great united states constitution i'll tell you he said it is in jeopardy i see forces rising all around us today that have as their goal and the objective the destruction of the very thing that made the United States the greatest nation in the world. Well, I'm not sure they paid much attention to him. He quoted from his 1923 speech the rest of his life. I finally got a copy of it. It's great. He took the whole strength, the golden threads of the Constitution to stress to the people here in Utah what a great responsibility they had to preserve that institution. Already, the foundations are being very badly eroded. And so, the State Department called him back as Assistant um, Secretary of State. Uh, he was puzzled about just what he should be doing. He thought, in Utah, we wanted him to run as Senator. Someone was talking about putting him on the Supreme Court. By this time, he had such a tremendous reputation, he could have almost named what he would like to have run for. And in this state, he would have been supported wholeheartedly, and it didn't work out. And instead of that, he became ambassador to Mexico. He did a great job down there. He taught the Mexican people to trust him and to love him. He did a lot to help our, our colonies, our Mormon colonies in Mexico during that difficult period where I went to school a couple of years. And then in 1933, right in the midst of his getting all of this thing straightened out for Mexico, here comes a letter from the first presidency calling him to be a counselor to Heber J. Grant. Now you've got to know a little bit about the background of J. Reuben Clark at that time as far as the church was concerned to appreciate <laughs> what a shock this was. He hadn't been where he could be active in the church for, um, what, 20, 25 years. He'd never been a bishop, never been a stake president, uh, paid his tithing. There wasn't any church very often to go to. Uh, in, Salt, in, in Washington, you could go to a little Sunday evening affair that Senator Smoot uh, held, but... Uh, J. Rubin didn't get along with Senator Smoot, so that was kind of an ordeal. <laughs> and anyway, he worked six days, a, seven days a week. He was a workaholic. And he afterwards said, I broke the Sabbath for years. And the Lord blessed me in spite of it, but certainly not because of it. You people obey the Sabbath day. Um, my close associate uh, while I was in law school, in fact, my, uh, my, my mentor was Ernest Wilkinson. He did the same thing because J. Reuben Clark did it. He'd work all day Sunday. He'd take time out for church. Well, he'd right back at it. And he, he said the same thing. He said, I broke the Sabbath day, tried to become a great lawyer. I paid a price for it. You obeyed the Sabbath day. Isn't that kind of interesting? So J. Reuben Clark, and I must hurry now just to give you a little final closing scene here. J. 
Reuben Clark was very disturbed that he would be called to the first presidency of the church. He found himself telling bishops and stake presidents how to run their, their stakes and their wards. Finally, he said, and this is an apocryphal story, although it's hinted to in Michael Quinn's Reuben Clark during the church years, but I have this apocryphal story in this form that I picked up from people who claimed they were close to the scene. J. Reuben Clark said to President Grant, don't you make these choices by inspiration? And President Grant said, yes, we do. And he, J. Reuben Clark said, I can understand why a, a lawyer of international prominence and so forth like myself may add to the prestige of the church, but I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm doing things that I never was trained to do. I'm instructing people. I, I, I feel very inadequate. Well, according to the story that I was told, President Grant said, that's not why you were chosen as a counselor. Well, why was, it, why was I chosen? You were chosen because the Constitution of the United States is in jeopardy. And the church needs to be aroused. The country needs to be aroused. And we've got to start training our people to defend that Constitution before it's shredded and lost. Oh, really? And you are the best constitutionalist in the church. All of a sudden, you hear him quoting his 1923 speech in conference. And you see, we were a democratic state, 62% Democrats. <laughs> and they began to call that Republican politics in conference. Oh, he got the Dickens. And by the time I got here to Utah sometime later, uh, J. Reuben Clark was one of the most unpopular people in this state. They didn't mind him talking on the gospel, but any time he'd start talking on the Constitution, that terrible Republican instrument, isn't that something? And that's uh, all through California schools, I was told the Constitution was obsolete. And here's this man standing up, at which everybody know, and he knows he's a Republican, defending the Constitution and that politics in church. And uh, President Grant would try to assure the people that we wanted the saints to hear this. It was not popular. Years later, he never did become a popular speaker. And years later, when I was here, um, he spoke at the University of Utah. Here is a member of the first presidency, and he was a counselor to three presidents over a period of 28 years. We never had another human being in this church serve as a counselor to presidents of the church longer than J. Reuben Clark. So he was so well known, they decided to have him speak at the University of Utah. Stood up before that audience, and they booed him. Remember the first presidency. Majority of the audience LDS. They booed him. And he stood there, by this time he's pretty heavy set, you know, uh, and he smiled at them and he said, well, I don't mind you calling me old fashioned because I am. Right. I don't even mind you calling me antediluvian, which is before the flood. <laughs> right. But he said, I am a little sensitive about you calling me prehistoric. <laughs> and the students all laughed and immediately they, they, they sat back to listen. And he gave them one of his, we've, I've got a copy of that speech and it's just great. And of course the students have been trained not to believe those things anymore. But he sowed the seeds. And already the Lord was beginning to build his kingdom preparatory to a, to survive the great destructive forces of constitutional government. You see, we didn't realize how badly shredded the Constitution had become. We didn't realize the, the whole concept of separation of powers had been shredded. We had Congress delegating to the, to the president 
the authority to make administrative law. Most of our laws were not coming out of Congress as required by Article I, Section 1 of the Constitution. They were coming out of bureau agencies at administrative law. And I studied it in school, how, how it worked. And next thing you know, if you didn't like what happened, where's your appeal? You didn't really have an appeal because Congress approved it. They were delegating their legislative authority and you were having laws that the Congress had never examined, scrutinized, or debated. And you were covered with them. I say we were covered with them. So that's how far we had gone. We'd lost our money system based on gold and silver. That was gone. We had lost control of the Supreme Court, which was now endorsing, um, beginning with the Butler case, 1936, the Congress could pass anything that they considered for the welfare of the American people. It was no longer general welfare. It was now private welfare, farmers, schools, etc. And J. Reuben Clark was a, an educator at heart. And he felt the schools were getting a, uh, a bad deal. And they, were get, they would be hurt in the process. And he tried to defend the importance of maintaining the integrity of our schools. That was interesting. So many things were happening to our society that from a constitutional standpoint, we were very seriously at risk. So this man from Florida that wrote this whole page of newspaper protests the other day, I just went down and checked off the items. Jay Rubin. Did you say amen? Yeah, he said amen, 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 amen. You know, going on to $4 trillion worth of debt, 62% of all your income tax is going to pay interest to banks on that debt. And we get ourselves a, a trillion dollar budget. Then we overspend even that much. You know that we're way off balance. I want to say just a little bit about the Butler case. 1936, the Supreme Court handed down a decision, and while it held against the appellant, it set forth the proposition that Congress can, can appropriate money and legislate for private welfare. The general welfare clause went right out the window. The original idea was if you tax all the people then you can't pass a law except for all the people. You cannot pass a law that will favor this little group and that little group or that. You can't do that. Because these are general taxes. States can handle those problems. The federal government cannot. That was all wiped out 1936 in the Butler case. Our budget in 1936, in spite of World War I, and already numerous uh, expensive programs for agriculture, et cetera, that had been coming up. Our budget was $8 billion. And we had gone to $800 billion by about 1980. Now you know where it is. Trillion. There's no stop. They will not stop. You couldn't stop that train no matter who you elected right now. So there's a remedy. J. Reuben Clark knew what it was. I'm going to close now by sharing it with you. But I just want to tell you how, much, how I learned to love that man and have him stand up in the face of a very antagonistic, not altogether, but the majority of our people of our state did not like J. Reuben Clark. His biographies all admit that. He wasn't appreciated until they had a symposium after he was dead and decided he was a great man. And I said, who do I read telling, saying he was a great man? Some of those who fought him the worst when he was trying to help us. But in those 28 years that he served three presidents and part of the time he was all alone. Brother Grant had a, had a stroke and lived another five years and couldn't do hardly anything. And David O. McKay, the other counselor, he was very sickly and weak until after, um, until he became president of the church. Isn't that interesting? All of a sudden, his health improved tremendously. So he, he did pretty good and just went on and on for a long time. J. Reuben Clark, of course, died in 1961. But by that time, 
President McKay had already given us the great announcement of hope. Beginning in 1950, he said God is now pouring out into the families of those that he has treasured up from the beginning, the youth that can take it in the days that lie ahead. You're getting some of the choicest spirits out of heaven. He announced that about 1950. By 1960, he said, and now I can tell you the new era has begun for this great kingdom. And will begin to become an influence for good much more impressive and much more productive than in the past. 1960. You see, we had worked 30 years to, to get 10,000 converts in Latin America. 30 years to get 10,000. We got the next 10,000 in two years. We got the next 10,000 in one year. Now we get 10,000 every few months. This is the new era, and you're in it. And um, all of the buildings that began, and during the last 10 years of David O. McKay's life, he felt so helpless. He asked me to do an errand for him one day, and I came and found him. He couldn't even stand up. He had a couple of strokes, and here were needles and oxygen tanks and one thing and another. And he could see as I looked around his office, the amazement in my eyes. He said, don't feel sorry for me, Brother Skousen. Nobody expects me to do anything. All I have to do is stay close to the Lord and make the decision, which he did. And we doubled the membership of the church in the next 10 years when he was an invalid. We doubled the number of temples. I tell you, we just went forward. So when these prophets become... Um, very elderly, indisposed, the work goes on magnificently. And in day, his day, J. Reuben Clark did that. Now President Hinckley and President Hon uh, Monson carry it on. Oh, what great leaders they are. I love them. Great leaders. So I come to my conclusion, and it's J. Reuben Clark's conclusion. He could see that the powers that existed were so well entrenched, so voluminous, had such a grip on media, both of the parties, the money, that um, that was going to have to run its course, like an express train going hell-bent to destruction. But the Lord isn't going to allow this government to be destroyed although administrations may destroy themselves, systems may destroy themselves, this country is going to survive. And J. Reuben Clark knew how it would survive. Build track two. Don't get in the way in front of that train. It'll just run over you on track one. You quietly build track two. And sometimes people say, Dr. Skousen, you spent your whole life studying these things that, are, that have gone wrong with uh, the attack on the Constitution and everything. Why are you so optimistic? And I say to them, I read the book, and in the end, we win. Now, it's on track two that we win. And J. Reuben Clark never lost confidence and having a generation finally become alert and finally doing its homework and getting into a position where they would do what God and the Founding Fathers intended we should have been doing all the time. And so, I, I bless his memory. I bless his integrity. I bless his tenacity. I am so grateful for that man. He's been my inspiration. I've learned to love him. I knew him, but not well. And I received counsel from him two or three times. One of my books became a national bestseller, and he gave me a little bit of counsel about what God was doing and what to expect, and I was very grateful for that. Oh, what vision, what insight he had. And so I close now. On other occasions, you'll tell more about him. I've only touched the highlights, because during the 28 years that he served in the kingdom, 
he filled several volumes with teachings and instructions and insights and warnings. And you will have other speakers, I'm sure, come and analyze various phases of that in detail so that you become authorities on the beliefs of J. Reuben Clark, which were identical with the original founding fathers. In the beginning, he says he made some mistakes, but he learned from experience. And in the end, when he finally became a counselor of the First Presidency, he told the saints what to expect. I should have told you that in, 18, in 1937, he gave one of his most famous speeches. I consider 1923, 1937, 1952 among his greatest talks. 1937, he said, the power people are now planning another war for you. They have made this depression last uh, many more years than it would have ordinarily lasted. And they got stock down to 14 cents on a dollar. They just bought up everything at 14 cents on a dollar, and they're now ready to make additional billions as they put you through another world war. And they're going to have you pay for it. You're going to be involved in it. You don't think you'll get involved, but they'll say that for the peace of the world, you must come in, and you'll feel so soft-hearted about it, you'll come in. It'll be just as big a mistake as World War I, which I thought was just great when we went in, and I now know could have been handled differently, and we could have saved ourselves a lot of problems. So he gave the prophecy, and then in 1941, after we were in the war, he said, may I quote from my 1923 speech and my 1937 <laughs> speech? And that's what he did the rest of his life, quoting his former speeches or he predicted what had happened, and it did. He truly was a prophet of God, counseling a prophet of God. And I bless his memory in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>